Try to imagine that you want to build a zoo. You want to attract as many visitors as possible, but you also want to do this with minimal effort. You add the most popular animals, a few majestic lions, some mighty elephants, the tall giraffes, and of course the cute penguins. Now a friend of yours suggests that you should really add some of those walking sticks to the collection, because those are his personal favorites. Hmm. The stock market is like a zoo. You only need a few of the best species to build a great zoo, and you only need a few of the best stocks to build a great portfolio. In this video, we will review some of the most common pitfalls in the process of picking the best stocks. This is a top 5 takeaway summary of The Investment Zoo, written by the great Canadian investor Stephen A. Jerislavski. And this is the Swedish investor, bringing you the best tips and tools for reaching financial freedom through stock market investing. Takeaway number 1. Beware the predators. Investors are operating in a jungle with many vicious animals. We have uh, the tigers, the poisonous frogs, the snakes, the vultures, etc. All of them will, whether intentionally or not, try to ruin your ultimate investment portfolio from time to time. First out, we have the friend who is advocating that the stock market is dangerous and who suggests different areas of investment, such as gold, real estate, or even governmental bonds. Don't let this guy fool you. The stock market is the best place to be for an early financial retirement for the average person. And here's why. Gold, as an investment, goes up and down a lot. But if you hold it for the long term, it's a mediocre investment to say the least. Gold does not produce any income whatsoever. Landslide victory for the stock market. Real estate can't really appreciate much in price over longer time periods, because otherwise few people would be able to afford living. Again, the stock market is the winner. And then of course we have governmental bonds. Let me ask you this, if bonds would return more than stocks, then why would anyone bother starting a business in the first place? Second on our list of dangerous animals is the politicians. There's a simple strategy for politicians to execute to be re-elected in a democracy. All they have to do is to take from those who have earned and saved and give to those who have not. Unfortunately, there will always be more of the latter, so you are pretty much guaranteed to get a majority vote. Taxes can be a heavy burden on your stock market portfolio if you don't have the right investment philosophy. But luckily, we will learn how to cope with this in takeaway number 2. Third out are the snakes. I mean the brokers and investment advisors. All too often, these people have their own interests and your portfolio returns is probably number 1000 on their list of priorities or something like that. A broker will encourage you to trade as much as possible because they make money on commissions. Therefore, they will give you stupid advice such as uh, you never lose money taking a profit. Investment advisors can be legit, but unfortunately, most of them are just salespeople in disguise. They make money from fees in mutual funds. Cut both of these guys out and do your own research. And fourth on our list is a bit more problematic. It's the management of some stock market companies. Beware companies where the CEO earns way more than the average of the industry, or the rest of the top management of that company. Also, beware those companies where the top management have huge stock option programs. Always remember that this is money coming out of your pocket as a shareholder. Takeaway number 2. Pay as few fees as possible. A pandemic disease hit society. Governmental regulations cause an industry to halt. War breaks out. There are many things that we cannot control in the investing arena. But there's one thing we certainly can control and that's our expenses. Expenses come in many shapes and forms for the investor. And the more of them you pay, the less your portfolio returns will be. I know this is not rocket science. 
Firstly, we have transaction fees. Every time you buy or sell a stock, your broker will earn a commission for executing the trade for you. Moreover, there's typically a difference between how much buyers are willing to buy for and sellers are willing to sell for, which is called a spread. Each time you buy or sell, you'll essentially have to wait for someone else to close this gap for you and risk not getting your transaction through, or you'll have to pay the spread. A friend of mine recently admitted to having about $1,000 in transaction fees during his last year of investing. He said he didn't think much of it. With an account of an estimated $50,000, you can't spend $1,000 in transaction fees each year. That's equal to a 2% loss on your total invested capital. This will make a terrible dent in your portfolio returns over the long run. Secondly, we have taxes. If you are from the US, the level of taxation on your capital gains depends on your holding period and level of income. There can be a huge difference, as high as 20%, in fact. Luckily, both of these fees are eliminated using the same strategy, buying stocks for the long run. To illustrate how much of a difference that these fees make, I will introduce two characters. High Fee Frank and Low Fee Felix. Both of them are equally skilled at picking the right stocks, and their annual returns are 15% before fees. Frank uh, trades a lot though, so he has to pay 2%, like my friend did, in transaction fees each year. And he also pays 35% in short-term capital gains tax each year. Felix, on the other hand, only pays 0.2% in transaction costs and 15% in long-term capital gains tax because he holds on to his stocks for an average of 5 years. Both of them start with $10,000 in capital and they save $500 per month from their salaries to add to their stock market portfolio at the end of each year. Let's say that a um, $2 million account is enough for them to retire. If they both start at age 20, Frank reaches his financial retirement by age 61, while Felix will reach it at age 49. That's 12 years more of vacations, spending more time with friends and family, doing the things you love, etc. that Felix gets compared to Frank. Just because he chose to hold on to his stocks for the long term. Think about it. Takeaway number three. What about diversification? Imagine that there's a lottery with 100 tickets. They cost a dollar each, and there's a $200 price on one of them, but there's no way to tell which one. If you got to participate in this lottery, what would you do? The correct answer is that you should buy all of the tickets. You simply can't afford to miss that winning one. Now imagine a different lottery where there are 100 tickets in total, and they cost a dollar each here as well. 50 of them are painted black, and those tickets are the winners, each with a $4 win. The other 50 tickets are white. What would you do if you got to participate in this lottery? Well, you'd only buy the black tickets, of course. The stock market is somewhere in between these two. It's not 100% skill-based, as our second lottery is, but it's certainly not 100% luck-based, as our first lottery either. With some practice and company research, you can improve your odds of picking the winning tickets, but only to a certain extent. Betting the house on a single ticket is therefore a bad idea, as it may be a losing one. There's always a risk of mistaking a mediocre or weak company for a strong one. But, at the same time, there are only so many good companies. Once you've picked one of them and removed it from the sample, it becomes increasingly more time-intensive and unlikely to find the next one. For this reason, diversification should only be practiced up to a certain point. Steven Yaroslavsky says the following. When I consider the small number of shares that interest me after 50 years of following stocks, I ask... Who owns all these other companies? And more importantly, 
Why? So, while some diversification is a good thing, just don't overdo it. Takeaway number four. True understanding of something can only be achieved by oneself. When uh, me and my family were on vacation in Greece, back when I was uh, 10 or something, my parents stressed me about the importance of using sunblock. As a stubborn little kid, I didn't want to listen. I thought it was too much trouble applying that every morning. So, what happened? Well, I overexposed myself and got burned quite badly on my cheeks. And now they are more or less permanently sensitive to the sun. In more recent years, I thought about investing in a technology startup. I'd heard that the famous investor Warren Buffett preached the importance of staying in your circle of competence, meaning that uh, you should only invest in situations that you understand yourself. This technology startup was certainly not such a situation. I had never invested in a startup before, and I didn't really understand the industry it was in either. But I must have thought that, uh, well, even Warren Buffett is wrong sometimes. So I put up my money anyways. Unsurprisingly, it looks like this is going to cost me. What's the lesson here? True understanding of something can only be achieved by oneself. And this is the reason why it's very, very difficult to coattail other investors. If your conviction doesn't come from your own research, but from that of someone else, it will be very difficult to make the right decisions on your portfolio holdings. This is especially true in times of turmoil, such as these days. Takeaway number 5. Yaroslavsky's Stock Checklist As a final takeaway, I'd like to present a few of the characteristics that Steven Yaroslavsky likes to see in the stock market companies that he invests in. Regarding the business, the company should be a leader in its industry, in an industry where innovation is low, within your circle of competence, non-cyclical and non-fashionable. Regarding the management, they should have competitive but not excessive salaries, develop managers from within, have board members that act in shareholders' interests and be shareholders themselves, in proportion to their salaries. Regarding the financials, the company should avoid excessive debt. Having excessive debt is like living with a sword of Damocles over your head. Have net income plus depreciation that exceeds interest payments by a fair margin. And have a strong current ratio. Other than that, the company should also have a fair price, show predictable earnings and dividend growth, look at the last 10 years. You prefer to see that earnings and dividends double every 5 to 7 years or so. Avoid mergers and acquisitions and have annual reports that are understandable. Companies that are producing legal gibberish should be avoided. Another animal that is popular at the zoo is of course the polar bear. If you enjoy what this polar bear is doing in trying to help you to improve your stock market returns, consider supporting his channel. I've recently made it possible for those of you who enjoy the content to sponsor the channel through a channel membership. In return, I'll be very grateful. And you will also get access to this awesome polar bear emoji. Cheers guys! <laughs>